Brother Jared and the choir, we praise God for Sister Beeler and how the Lord has used her today as they have all lifted up their voices and lended their gifts in the worship of our God on this Resurrection Sunday. I hadn't heard that song in quite some time and it took me back. It's a beautiful arrangement and we praise God for Clarence and all of those who play on musical instrument. Ashley, we thank God for you too. For a few moments, I want to preach and teach from the subject, Sometimes We Weep, Nevertheless He Is Risen. Can you say that with me? Sometimes we weep, nevertheless He is risen. Dear God, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for the fact that Jesus got up because he got up, we can get up. Indeed, his resurrection is called the first fruit of a harvest of those who will be resurrected from the dead. God, we thank you for your mercy because when it comes to resurrection, we need all of you. There's nothing we can do once we have breathed our last on this side of glory. All we can do is wait until our change comes. But God, we thank you that there is the promise that you have made to all of those who receive your son and will believe in his name and follow him that there will be a great resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous. God, we thank you for that promise. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight. God, you are our strength and you are our redeemer in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In all of the gospel accounts of Jesus' resurrection, which was a totally unique resurrection that stands head and shoulders above any other resurrection events mentioned in the Hebrew scriptures or the New Testament. Because unlike the other resurrections that are mentioned in the Bible, Jesus' resurrection from the dead did not involve a prophet acting on someone else's behalf to temporarily raise them from the dead, only to have them to die eventually in the next few months or in the next few years. This resurrection was a one of a kind and first of its kind occurrence, wherein a person who was murdered, executed, had the life and life's blood drained out of them. You know, we love singing, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. I know it was the blood for me. We like singing those kinds of songs, but do you really think about the lyrics? That was Jesus' real life's blood being drained out of him as he bled out on a Roman cross, killed by religion gone bad and an out of control Roman empire. And after three days of being dead, Jesus comes back to life, lungs filled with air again, systems, internal systems on go again, without any other human intervention, without the insertion of human agency. And this resurrection event, including John's version of it, which we have just read partially, this event is so out of pocket and beyond our abilities to categorize what had happened, that John's account fumbles around, just like all of the other gospel accounts, as he and the other authors were trying to explain that which cannot easily be explained in human terms. I mean, this event was not science fiction, Though it sounded like, or it seemed like, it seemed like something H.G. Wells or Jordan Peele would have thought up. This did not happen because of special effects or CGI making it happen. No, a person who was sure enough dead 
in living color in three dimensions, but shown up dead for an extended period of time, began breathing again. And walking and talking again, just like he had prophesied that he would. Never to see death again. Jesus never died after that. Never to stop breathing again. Never would his body cease to move and function again. In fact, after he rose from the dead, his body seemed to be able to do much more than it could before he died. He suddenly appears to the disciples, some of whom are doubting. They're in a closed upper room, and yet he comes in without having to knock on the door. But yet he still is physical and tangible enough that he eats and drinks with them after he has risen from the dead. I think because Jesus' life, death, and resurrection were so mind-blowing and disorienting to all who experienced it and heard about it in that day, John and the other gospel writers had a hard time describing and putting into words and into proper sequential order exactly what happened and how it happened. Consider the fact that John's gospel of what happened on that resurrection day, resurrection day, John's account of how it occurred, John's account is slightly different from the other accounts in the synoptic gospels of what took place that first Easter. All of the writers struggle to explain the mystery of all mysteries. Life, death, and resurrection are the greatest mysteries out of all the mysteries related to human existence. I mean, don't get me wrong, all of the essential facts in all of the four gospel narratives are telling a unified story. Jesus was betrayed by Judas. He was forsaken by his disciples, taken to trial, mocked, brutalized, and then crucified, died on the cross, buried in a borrowed tomb, and rose from the dead on the third day. And when the women, Mary and the other women, came to the tomb, the stone was already rolled away. And so in every single resurrection account, the women had a major role in discovering the event and then testifying about it to the men. These facts are fairly consistent in all four Gospels. And if you think about it for a moment, the way the gospel writers talk about the role of women and on that resurrection morning is, is very striking and it's noteworthy. And it's very convincing as we think about the validity of the resurrection report. Because not too many men in their right minds, especially at that time and a few men today, would have made up a story that gave women a starring role in the story, especially given the patriarchal society of the first century where women were considered not much higher than women, uh, children and they were considered as property. If these were just made up stories, the women would have not been anywhere in the, these narratives. But because these stories are true, the women are heroic. From the cross to the empty tomb, they are the first and last ones there in the Gospels. Because God has God's hands all over these real events. And God is turning convention upside down or maybe right side up. Historically, it is worth noting that the 19th century AME preacher, an African-American woman named Jarena Lee, often leaned, she often leaned on this resurrection narrative in the Gospel of John, the one we just read, to validate her own preaching authority and prowess. Because purportedly, when the men of her day questioned her about why she should be allowed to preach, she was prone to raise the question, did not Mary Magdalene first preach the risen Savior? 
and early 19th century essayist and orator and political philosopher, an African-American sister named Maria Stewart, she too often leaned on our text saying, did not Mary Magdalene first declare the resurrection of Christ from the dead as she verified the role of women in speaking and preaching in public spaces in 19th century America. In all the Gospels, including John's Gospel, there is much unity and commonality around this cosmic shaking, devil dismantling, shirt a earth shattering, hope inspiring event that we call the resurrection, which was the greatest event to ever happen for the souls and bodies of black folk and all folk of various colors who desire to have a living hope beyond the grave. Do you have a living hope beyond the grave? Hence, we do not have to doubt these stories because not only do the gospels agree that the women were there and shared the good news but they agree that there were angels present now they differ on the, the the number of angels who appeared but they all agree that there were angels present and that eventually men came to the tomb having been shocked by the testimony of the women and the gospels agree that eventually Jesus appears to a wide range of people on different occasions over a 40 day period. And they are unified. The gospel writers are unified in that initially many folk who saw him did not recognize Jesus. But even with these points of agreement between the authors, there are some discrepancies and mysteries which remain as we read through each account from Matthew to John. One account might mention two angels, another one angel. One account might imply that the women came to the tomb while it was still dark. Another uh, implies that it might have been at the breaking of day, that the sequence of timing was different. And then there are some happenings in the stories that just don't make much sense to us. Perhaps it was because the gospel writers, as they work from a larger body of gospel material about Jesus, a few important and precious documents written about the life of Jesus as told and written by the apostles at various points. Then the writers who compiled those four gospels decades later under great stress as persecution arose against the followers of Christ. And because they were putting each gospel together with a particular audience in mind and they wanted to emphasize their own particular theological convictions about Jesus. And as they wrestled with deep concerns about life and death and resurrection, they were more focused on telling us about the main thing. And they were interested in keeping the main thing, the main thing that he got up. There are some strange parts of the resurrection narratives that are never fully explained. And chief among them for me it's why didn't disciples like Mary recognize the Lord? This is something I've already alluded to. Why didn't she recognize the Lord? I've always wondered, especially looking at this gospel, the gospel of John, why did Mary not immediately recognize Jesus or his voice after he had walked up near her and asked her, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? But as we think about the Gospels, this one in, in particular, as I think about it, I had an aha moment in reference to that question, especially as I studied this text. As I looked at this text again in my studies, I discovered that perhaps maybe the answer was always right there in the text as to why she couldn't recognize the Lord. Maybe the answer was al always in plain sight right in front of my eyes. The negativity that was impacting her view and what was right in front of her eyes. Could it be, given how things are described by John, that she could not discern the identity of the Lord that morning 
because of the combination of the shock that she was still experiencing for the last day or so, the last few hours, the shock of seeing her best friend, her Lord, her teacher and spiritual leader and Messiah crucified publicly. Could it have been the shock, but more importantly, and this is when I had my aha moment, more importantly, for preaching purposes this morning, could her vision not have been also affected? Could it have been affected because of the deluge of tears, the tears that were flooding her eyes? You see, as John describes the event in our text, John tells us that Mary Magdalene, she peered into that tomb. And as she peered and looked into that tomb, she was crying almost inconsolably. You see, the text uses, John uses a Greek word, kleo. Can you say that with me? Kleo. This word means intense sobbing. If you are engaged in kleo, you need a whole lot of Kleenex to deal with your kleo. Because Cleo didn't mean that one was simply crying just a little with a tear here and there. This Greek word meant that one was boohooing. So perhaps because she is sobbing and is so distraught and overwhelmed with grief and shock, shock and trauma. I mean, after all, she is at the grave site of the man who had cast seven demons out of her, according to another gospel, liberating her from demonic possession and mental illness. Has Jesus ever set you free from something? Has Jesus ever liberated you from something, something awful, something repulsive, something restrictive, something limiting, something hellish, and yet the Lord came into your life and gave you hope through his word. He gave you help through his people. This was the man who gave Mary Magdalene purpose and meaning and wisdom for the last few years. And now, not only had he been publicly executed, killing her hopes and dreams, killing the Lord who she loved, but in her mind, from her perspective, someone had disrespectfully removed the body in the darkness of the night without telling her or any of the women who were with her, any of her sister friends, none of them knew, and she couldn't take it anymore. She comes to a breaking point. Sisters and brothers, whenever we are dealing with subjects as deep and as profound as life and death, especially the life and death of our loved ones, and then add the implausibility and incredulity of a possible resurrection in the mix, an event the gospel's writers were struggling to explain, then like Mary, the possibility of a real resurrection is the furthest thing from our consideration. And when we are grappling with such issues, with issues of displacement and sickness and hurt and trauma, sometimes Easter celebrations and resurrection talk can seem unreal, like religious rituals and fables meant to get the church fired up so that we can add more members to the roll on Easter morning. So my question is, on this Easter, as we think about Mary, as we think about how the gospel writers were struggling to explain this event. On this Easter, are you really able to take in what the implications of Jesus' resurrection are for you? And for your family? And for your circle? And your friendships? And your relationships? Or is your vision obscured like Mary's because your soul is weeping today and your soul is overwhelmed? When so much in life is up and down and wrapped up in one trauma after another, then our souls begin to weep. We, we might not tell anyone. We might not even really know it ourselves, but our souls can cry. Is your soul weeping this morning? When our souls are weeping, we are left unsteady and disoriented out on our feet like a punch drunk boxer. And when we are in this unstable state, this emotional state, resurrection talk doesn't make much sense. 
We cannot fully process it. It sounds like gibberish or some fanatical fantasy. It sounds like talk of another language. I never will forget the day. This day happened in 1986. Though I cannot recall all of the details of what I was doing the moment I experienced this event, I will not forget the day. I had taken a break from college. I was working a part-time job cutting fish for a living. I cut it for a large grocery store chain in Chicago called Jewel Foods. It was like Myers or something like Kroger's. I cut fish for a living and I worked in a department that worked hand in hand with the butcher department. And at that time, we still actually cut whole fish and filleted whole fish. And there I was one morning in 1986, I had gotten to work early and then I was getting down to business. The store opened and I was cutting a fish. It was about maybe 11 a.m. And we had a radio on in the little area in which we worked. And I happened to hear on the radio that someone had been murdered in a house on the southwest side of Chicago. And so then I was listening a little bit more attentively. And then they gave the address of where the body had been found. And as I listened to that address, I said, I think that's the same block as my best friend's house. And as the more I listened, then they explained the victim and how she was found and her name. And I said, oh my goodness, that's my best friend's younger sister. She had been killed in their home when no one else was there. And to this day, we have our suspicions about who did it. Someone had just been released out of prison, someone we knew who only lived a couple of doors down. But as I listened to that awful and terrible news, I experienced something I have not experienced since that moment. As people walked up to the counter to put in their order for fish, I could see their mouths and lips move but I could not hear one word that they said to me. I was out of it. I was, I was not all there. I was not fully cognizant of what was being asked of me in that moment. With the news of that death and the memories I had of hanging out at that address, I could not believe what I was hearing. I was in temporary shock, so much so that as customers walked up, I could not continue to do my work. And I had to take about an hour or so break. Then I got on the phone and I called people I knew, her family, and it was verified. My soul was weeping. Can we be honest <clears throat> and keep it real? Can we keep it 100 on Easter? You know that you know that you know that you have been through some stuff in the last few years that deserves you having a good cry. In the last few years, some of you have realized that the dreams you had hoped to achieve are never going to be achieved in this lifetime. Some others have come to the realization that the dreams you had always hoped to achieve, the ones you have now achieved, you finally achieved them, but they don't satisfy you. And after climbing the ladder of success, you realize that your ladder was perched up against the wrong building. God has allowed you to be shaken every which way but loose the last few years, and the garden variety Easter sermon just won't do it for you. You and I are still inching our way through a global pandemic that has killed 6.2 million people. 6.2? Nearly a million people in this country alone. Nearly 36,000 people in Michigan were killed by complications from COVID-19. Almost 8,000 deaths alone in Wayne County. This kind of news warrants a good cry. And now, in addition, most of the Western nations around the world are trying our best to not be drawn into World War III because of an ego maniacal dictator who will stop at nothing to grab more territory, more land, and more power. 
This has been a traumatic two years, hasn't it? And who would have thought that the former president would politicize a deadly disease? because he did not want the economy affected under his watch. So his strategy, which was a devilish strategy, was just ignore COVID. Just act like it doesn't exist and hate on the scientific community. Who would have believed that then his followers would blindly act out violently and not just because they were resisting mask wearing, not just in order to resist taking the vaccine that has saved millions of lives, but who would have thought that some of his most ardent followers would then storm the U.S. Capitol? and resort to the most insane and violent and anti-democratic uh, activity and behavior that we have seen in recent American history. Sisters and brothers, this warrants a good cry and not just the usual spouting off of religious tradition and familiar Christian dogma. Sometimes we have to cry because our souls are weeping and going back further than recent history, together as a people, we are still trying to recover from post-traumatic slavery syndrome. A curse that we have been shaking off for at least the last 150 years in Jesus' name. And we are just a few years out from Jim and Jane Crow. And now in part because our souls are still weeping and the devil is still busy, even we black folk seem to be losing our minds in ways that we didn't seem to lose them before, publicly and strangely. Everything from that slap heard around the entertainment world to the much more serious taking up of arms of a black man who appears to at least be in his late 50s or early 60s and he decides to shoot people, as many people as possible, in a New York subway. You know that these are all signs that our souls are weeping and our minds have been burdened and some of us have broken under the pressure and the stress. Is your soul Weeping like Mary's this morning? Toss in the troubles in your personal life or our general struggle to be Christian and godly in an often anti-Christian and anti-godly environment. Our struggles to not cuss out the person who you know and they know too are messing with you just to see if they can walk on your last nerve with combat boots and Timberlands on. Oh, toss in... <laughs> trying to survive a level of inflation that we haven't seen since the time when I was a young lad in the 70s, while the averages of national incomes have remained the same for at least about the last decade as the salaries of CEOs and CFOs and corporate oligarchs are at the top and they've increased beyond even their wildest dreams as a rapacious form of capitalism keeps chugging right along as the middle class and underclasses are left with just a few pennies on the dollar and now most of us i don't know about you maybe you're sitting on big bank but now most of us cannot afford what homes cost today heck it's hard to even cover rent in most places today unless you're living somewhere where the roaches and rats are trying to run you out of your own living room. It's hard to make it on a middle class salary. Then it is easy, if you understand all of this, it's easy to understand why the gospel writers struggled to describe these incredible events and why Mary did not immediately know that Jesus was standing right next to her, even as she was looking for him. Because it is hard to see resurrections when we are going through or have been through traumas and we're disoriented and have tears flowing down our souls. Is your soul weeping today? Didn't Smokey say in his classic song, the tracks of my tears, people say I'm the life of the party. Because I can tell a joke or two. Although I might be laughing loud and hearty, deep inside, y'all know the rest. So take a good look at my face. You'll see my smile looks out of place. If you look closer, it's easy to trace. 
the tracks of my tears. On this Easter morning, we are thankful for life. We are. Even with its concomitant painful challenges, Mary was still a blessed woman and she knew it. Even in those dreaded hours between Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, she and the others went through the awful waiting and weeping together. And yet she and the others were still blessed on Silent Saturday. As painful as it was because she and the others still had the life of God flowing through them. And when we have the life of God still flowing through us, it doesn't matter how bad things look in the moment. There's always hope. Where would we be without life? We would not be anywhere. We would not have anything. Because absent of life, there is nothing. I'm talking about for the unsaved. There's nothing. And nothing just won't do, especially if you've already lived once. Nothing just brings on the flaming torment of nothingness and regret and deadness. And yet, Mary and the others still had a modicum of peace and joy because they were still alive, even in their pain and suffering. Glory be to God, life is the force that opens the door to countless possibilities and experiences. Life brings the possibility of both new joy and new hurts, love and hate, sunshine and cloudy skies, a new start and an old trail, a new song and the same old tune. Life is the open door to all kinds of big possibilities and, and life in general and human life in particular is strange. It's a strange gift. It's a priceless gift. It is a gift. Life is a gift, meaning that it does not originate with us. We didn't create it. Life has been given to us. We have been blessed with it. We have it and all that's attendant with it. Nature deposits seeds here and there and everywhere in the spring. And they are nourished in the soil. Underneath the surface, while most of us aren't even watching, the seeds begin to open up because life is at work in them. And as the spring wind and the heavenly zephyrs of creation move rain and pollen and other kinds of seeds to their right locations for the purposes of fruitfulness, for crops, for harvest, or just to make the world more beautiful with its flowers. And then babies are born in the human family. New animals and other creatures are born and come on the scene. All indicative of the fact that life is at work and life does not stop. You can smell life in the air. You can see signs of it everywhere because it's a gift. Are you thankful for this gift? But, but here's the thing. Sin has crept in. The world has become corrupted. And God said that with life there would also be death. Paul said that with life comes a burdensome groaning quality with it in Romans 8. All of creation, Paul says, groans and seems to be on a celestial and terrestrial teeter-tottering experience of instability because death is a part of life for now. At the back door of every person's experience of life waits death. Like the whale in the novel Moby Dick that tries to swallow everything up in its path. Barring religious philosopher Rudolf Otto's words, this is a part of the mysterium tremendum that we have to face as we wait on God, but also wait on death. But the good news is, as I take my seat, and there is good news in the text and in our lives, Though Mary has tears in her eyes and death seems to have won the day, the tables in our text and in our lives are beginning to turn. And God is the one overturning tables again. With eyes full of tears, Mary encounters two strangers dressed in white clothing. They are sitting on the spot where Jesus' body had been lying. She is standing outside of the tomb looking in. And these two who are sitting in the tomb try to make an emotional and spiritual connection with her because they are not ordinary people, though for some reason they look ordinary to her. 
Woman, why are you weeping? This is more than a rhetorical question. It is a question that might help Mary begin the spiritual self-analysis that she needs to gain, that she needs in order to gain a different and new perspective on life. Every now and then, God sends us just the right person or people to ask us the hard and critical questions when our souls are weeping so that we might snap out of it, so that our souls can be healed and stop weeping. Notice what they don't say to her. They don't tell her, Mary, don't weep. I know they sing that in that popular song. But these angels don't say to her, don't weep. They don't deny her her right to feel the way that she does. In fact, it makes sense for her to feel the way that she does, given the circumstances that she knows at the time. But they ask her so that she might engage in some self-reflection. Why am I weeping, she responds. Isn't it obvious? I've got good cause to weep. My hopes have been dashed because someone or some ones have broken in and I don't know who they were, but they have come along and taken the dead body of my Lord away. And I don't know where they've laid him. And everything that I had was wrapped up in him. Oh, sisters and brothers, when you build all your hopes on Jesus and upon things that are eternal, sharing the good news, living the good news, serving God's people, serving in the world, advocating for others, and lifting up others because love has lifted you, you are making the best investment of all, though it will wear you out sometimes, though you might have to weep for a season. Know that God's got your back. God's got God's people's back. Even when they are wounded and worn and weeping, even when we have reached the end of our ropes and hopes because there's another level of protection. Because for those who have sold out for the Lord, especially when you are at your lowest point, I'm telling you as a witness, Jesus will show up in a special way just for you. In a way he doesn't show up for just anybody and everybody. Just to let you know that what you thought was destroyed, what you thought was dead forever, what you thought was lost, it is not lost ultimately. It is not dead forever. It was just put on ice. It was just put on hold. There was just a comma placed around it. But the sentence of that thing continues on. It's not dead forever. It was maybe reconfigured for you until the fullness of time when you could receive it. God has not forgotten what you've committed to God. God has not forgotten Mary and God has not forgotten you. God will sometimes allow things to seem like all hope is gone, even for a disciple of Jesus. But right when we are our most disoriented and frustrated all the way to the bottom of who we are, God will show up in that bottomed out place just to let us know that the best is still in view and God has not forgotten any one of us. You see, after explaining why she was a weep weeping to these two strangers, she senses someone walking up, approaching her from the rear, somewhere behind her. It's almost like she's got a sixth sense operating. David wrote, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And she begins having a Psalm 23 experience and blessing through the Holy Ghost. Walking right up to her, there's the man who embodies goodness and mercy. And sensing this presence of goodness and mercy, the text says she turns. She sees this man but cannot clearly see her through her tears. And immediately this third stranger asked her the same question as the first two strangers. Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Sir, if you've carried him away, please tell me where have you laid him and then I will take him away. And it seems at this moment in her pathos and pain and what she says, it even begins to get next to Jesus. Even the heart of this third stranger seems to break. And to shake her out of her depression, he says just one word, a personal word, her name, Mary. 
And the way he said it, she knew. She knew who was addressing her. She knew who was personalizing her circumstances. Have you ever had the Lord to call your name? Have you ever had the Lord to let you know when you were at your lowest that he knew you personally and intimately and had your address, your birth certificate and your divine social security number imprinted on his heart? Just by calling her name, Mary, the way Jesus had always called her name, he made the connection for her. And she knew that he who was dead, the one she saw crucified, the one who said it is finished, the one she had invested so much in, was alive again. Never to die again. Then she fully turns and says, Rabbi, teacher, because this is what the resurrection can do for all of us. It can restore relationships and teach us that life continues on for the believer. You might be grieving the loss of some loved one. Maybe your mother, your father, a sister, a brother, a good friend, your ace boom coon, a child. I'm here to tell you that the resurrection is personalized just for you. And if they died in Christ, they are not dead either. They are living. They are more alive now than they were on this side. And Calvary, I've stopped by on this Resurrection Sunday to announce to you and to me that like Mary, sometimes we do weep, but don't lose heart. Keep living sold out for God because even though we all weep, nevertheless, he is risen. Even though we all weep, nevertheless, he is risen. He is not dead. He's alive, never to die again. And if he is alive, you have hope. You have a friend. You have someone in your corner. Who makes all of the difference. And don't fret because he is the resurrection and the life. He can bring back your peace. He can bring back your joy. He can restore your dignity, your liberty, your courage, and your faith. Just hold on. Take one day at a time. And just claim every day. Especially when life gets hard. Claim out loud so you can hear yourself. Just as Bill Gaither wrote it. Because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives and then one day I'll cross that river I'll fight life's final war with pain and then as death gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. Oh, hallelujah. All fear is gone because I know, I know, I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. We praise God for the gospel, even as we weep sometimes, nevertheless, he is risen. Maybe there's one here today, you have heard the gospel message preached and sung, and now you want to respond by giving your life to Jesus Christ. As I say every Sunday, he will make your life brand new. What he's done for many others, he will do for you. Won't you come at this time if you are in the sanctuary, we invite you to come. If you're online, we invite you to call area code 313-537-2590. That's area code 313-537, thank you, 2590.